great campaigns of uh, like a trail of cookies. So each time you get to a cookie, the cookie should get bigger every time you go along. I'm not talking web cookies, I'm talking actual cookies. Um, and the problem is I think when people don't do it right, they'll put a big cookie in front of the audience and at the start and the audience will fundamentally get indigestion. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now here's your host, Justin Getty. G'day listener and welcome to this episode of the Property Developer Podcast, a show dedicated to inspiring you with ideas and tips to take your developing to the next level. I trust you are doing well and your projects are progressing forward. Not too much to report on my townhouse project. We've been working through some drainage issues due to a discrepancy between some drawings, which has resulted in the need for a slightly bigger and reconfigured drain system. It caused a couple of days delay while it got resolved, but things are back moving along. The drainage set out should be done in the next few weeks, and then the builder will begin pouring the foundations. Following on from my chat with Gail Stapleton about development finance, I thought I would invite her back in a couple of episodes' time to dig a little deeper on finance and see if we can unearth some more detail on ensuring you get your finance sorted. I've got a few areas I would like to cover off with her in more depth, so keep an ear out for that. Also during the week, I caught up with a listener of the podcast who contacted me and shared some detail around the developing he is up to. So thanks to Sanford for getting in touch, and I look forward to seeing your developments progress. Today's guest is Ben Buxton from Grenade, a creative agency that does a lot of work with developers on marketing their projects. Ben comes from a family with a rich tradition of involvement with the property industry and real estate development. He has a ton of experience working on some very large and high profile projects, so he really understands how you go about successfully selling a property development. Our conversation covers the key elements you want to cover with your project marketing mistakes developers make when marketing their project, and some ideas for how you can market your next property development. Ben is a really keen surfer, so I started off by asking him if he could only choose one break to surf, what would it be? Uh, Good question. Probably uh, the entrance to Port Phillip Bay, I'd say. It's uh, famously known as Quarantines. Um, That's where you'll find me when it's big or small, um, sitting out there with all the sharks. Why that particular break? Uh, it's well, it's sort of it's like actually surfing in Indonesia. Um, just a little bit colder. A little bit colder, and uh, yes, yeah, just you know, you go out on the boat, so it sort of has that journey aspect to it, which is always fun. Um, and it's, yeah, pretty real. It comes out of very deep water, so it's a pretty heavy situation. There's always something going on: boats, people, locals, fights, etc. So that's the spot. Oh, sounds exciting. That's my number one. Wow, I thought you would have gone for something more exotic like Mexico or uh, Mentos, Hawaii. Sumatra. But no, here in Melbourne yeah. or Victoria. Might have been a panic answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, you come from a family that's done a lot of developing. Can Correct. you give us a bit of a background on yourself and how you got into project marketing and also you do a bit of developing yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we've we've got uh, five generations of, of property within our family. Um, so it was started um, by J.R. Buxton, who, who came out from England, um, and he basically set up J.R. Buxton Real Estate. So um, in some sense, you, know, you could basically say property is in the blood. Um, sometimes when the market goes up, so does the blood pressure. So it's, uh, it's, it has a phys- physical effect on the body as well as a, a mental one. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm currently um, there's a lot of developers in our family. Um, I specialise more so in property marketing than development per se. Um, but my father um, started Beckton with Max Beck uh, back in the 80s. Um, so, yeah, so we've always been around a lot of uh, developers and property activity and investing, etc. I mean, even even as a youth, um, my father used to bring models of big uh, towers from the city home and my younger brother and I would sort of light them up or, you know, burn them, that kind of thing, which was always fun. Um, so, yeah, certainly there was a, a level of osmosis that, that was created from my upbringing. Um, I got into property marketing uh, in a, around about 92 
and worked for a, uh, an ad agency in South Melbourne um, on Jones Lane Wooden, it was back then. Um, and yeah, basically um, took on my first actual project. I think it was about 94 uh, as an independent project, which was the Anchorage in Port Melbourne. So we, uh, I got offered that job from, from MAB. And uh, yeah, basically took off from there. So I've been doing what I've been doing for circa 20 years. Um, and yeah, certainly still pinch myself as to how lucky I am and blessed in terms of what we get to do and, and we get paid you know, good money for, for doing this process, which every day is you know, different and, and still quite exciting. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a good career thus far. So can, can you tell us a little bit about what it is that project marketers do? Is that what you would call yourself, a project marketer? Mm-hmm. Or? Yeah, so basically... I guess uh, generally we elevate projects, so so we take uh, we get approached by a developer uh, with a, a, a block of land, um, so it's quite early in the piece. Um, they they will have had a permit issued, um, and they will have a scheme on the block of land, and we basically we theme the project, um, so we create a campaign, which enables the developer to fundamentally sell um, the individual apartments or or whatever it may be, townhouses. And uh, so we we name the project, um, and then once we've named the project, we basically brand the project. So we give the name a personality and we dress it up in such a way that it will be attract, attractive for a particular market. Um, and we position the, the project in a way that it will sell, and then we basically come up with all the tools and the tricks um, for people to get, I guess, dazzled or... Um, seduced by the project um, so yeah we, we create stories um, around the fundamental aspects of the project that will sell it um, and then basically produce those stories in a way that when people see them they basically are attracted to them and they want to buy them I love this idea about stories because I believe in them Thank as you. well can you give me an example about how, that, how a story would come together or what it might look like? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we've recently uh, just branded um, Opera for Golden Age, so Jeff Shu. Um, he'd probably be top three um, Chinese developer in Australia at the moment or you know, in the top three. And so Opera is a building. It was a Bates Smart design, um, beautiful building, St Kilda Road, very dramatic, um, fantastic sort of movement within the building and the initial... Um, Design was based uh, around a dance between Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Um, so we wanted to continue the dramatic theme and basically came up with the name Opera, which was a very dramatic name. Um, and then the stories and the images that we, we basically used to tell that story were very dramatic. So sh- everything that we created had this, um, I guess, theatrical theme underneath the whole campaign. So... To me, um, if you nail a, a good idea at the start of a process, then basically everything then falls into place as you go through the creation of a campaign. So that was, I guess, a, a story that inspired was initially inspired by the architect's vision, and then we basically took that to the next next level. Um, in the, I guess, operatic feel, we basically uh, employed a dancer, um, and we we. Um, photograph the dancer with these beautiful um, fashion outfits and, and basically use that as one of the leading images for the campaign. So that's sat on the side of the building and on the website, etc., etc. So people, when they saw the campaign, were, I guess, um, basically excited about um, seeing something that was quite different. Um, and, you know, they basically sold out, I think, 240 apartments within a record amount of time. So um, it makes a big difference, I think, if you step out sign the norm in terms of delivering a project or presenting a project and basically give the market something unique or something inspirational. So just going back to what you said about making it attractive to a prospective buyer, Mm -hmm. so in the case of opera, would you then identify a buyer or the likely buyer as being someone that aspires to being culturally aware or considers themselves to be uh, culturally rich? Yeah, well, it's very near the art centre, so that was, you know, certainly an, an underflowing um, 
rhythm or feel for, for that address. Um, so, yeah, we, we thought having that link with, you know, basically what is the heart of Melbourne's arts precinct was a really good link and also a good link for the agents to sell the property. Um, and I think with this project we identified that possibly 70% of the buyers will be owner-occupiers. So, you know, I think Melbourne owner-occupiers at, at the price per square metre that they were looking to hit are quite a savvy market and, and know what they want. They're you know, certainly educated. They're into the arts. Um, they don't want to be, I guess, fed something that's, that's standard. They want something that, um, I guess, possibly um, excites them, pushes them a little bit, um, you know, possibly not confronting, but sort of basically um, in that direction. So, yeah. I think um, that's why we, you know, we're happy to sort of, I guess, continue that architectural theme. Okay. And then you mentioned the agent selling them. So how do you work in with a selling agent? Uh, well, basically, sometimes the agent um, is chosen before we're chosen. Uh, in some cases, they're not. So um, if the agent is chosen, then we'll basically, we'll touch base with them uh, usually in a workshop at the start of the process and, and um, evaluate who the buyer is and where they see the market and, and the product fitting. Um, so, you know, to me it's just a matter of, I think, being working in congruency with the agents and I guess also from a broader point of view, the developer and the architect. Um, but certainly, you know, I think having a, a strong synergy with the agents is key. Um, in some cases, I guess to be Honest, you need to steer the agents as well in terms of um, some of the agents just want to sell quickly and, and possibly may not understand the uh, some of the more sophisticated aspects of branding. Agents will probably kill me for saying that, but that's, I think, the reality of the matter. Um, so sometimes you need to lead the process to a degree as well. But, um, yeah, I think certainly, I mean, even from a display suite point of view, having a good understanding of, of the person at the front line who is the agent how they're going to sell and, and what they're going to do at different stages of the sales experience. Having a good understanding of that certainly informs us as to how we set the space up or set the space up with them. So it makes a big difference having the strong link. So can you give us an example of how you might then go about setting up, say, a sales um, suite for Opera? Yeah, well, basically sit down with the agent um, and ideally the architect as well and basically say, well, you're going to meet the person at this part of the, uh, the process, which is the start. Um, and then from here, I, I like to theme display suites in a way that we start from a very uh, high-level form of information and go down to details. So at the start, you're basically usually informing the person or the buyer about the, pro- the project, where it is, the address, um, possibly Melbourne or whichever city you're in as to basically the context that this site sits in. Um, and then you'll basically go through the project itself, um, how that works, so you possibly may then have the model um, in the space, um, video experience, etc., etc. So it's just a matter of, I think, step-by-step step walking through um, the agent's sales pitch and then basically paralleling that with the sales tools that we create um, and making sure that... Um, you're starting off at large uh, format information and go into small detail information. I think if you give detail too early in the piece, then people get nervous or basically get lost in the detail. So the detail in terms of the finishes and, and specifics usually come towards the end of the process and then basically people then get signed up after that, ideally. So. And when would you use a project marketer as opposed to just a selling agent? Well, the two are quite different. So we basically, I guess, create the tools that the agents use to sell. Um, that being said, um, I guess there, there's budget you know, specific details that um, need to need to work in with the visibility. Um, but yeah, I mean, most agents, I guess, in terms of marketing apartments or townhouses. Um, Unless they're individual apartments or townhouses, um, 
usually will rely on someone to basically produce all the information, whether they be renders or, or brochures or websites, etc. So ideally, you'd need a project marketer every time. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking for developers out there who maybe aren't doing 100 apartments or yeah. 100 townhouses. Yeah, well, there's still, I mean, there's, you know, there's smaller keyed agents and there's smaller keyed um, design studios or marketing studios that could basically take on smaller jobs. So I think it's just a matter of um, horses for courses and finding the right fit. So, you know, certainly you could, even if you've got five townhouses, you could go to, you know, a freelance designer and basically get them to work in with the agent um, in terms of coming up with all the collateral. But it certainly, I think, uh, is worth having, even from a point of view of having an, an extra eyes on what is produced, um, it, it does make a big difference. So, you know, I guess what we're doing is we're selling an aspiration um, and not a reality as such. So it's certainly... It, it, pays to have that aspiration created or curated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know I did a lot of the collateral myself for my project. And it shows. It just Sorry, because... I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't do the design. <laughs> uh, but just to get the... Just because I thought I could do a better job than what the agent mm. would do, because a lot of the agents... Uh, I don't know whether my agent would be listening to this or not, yeah, but yeah. they have a very Lock your of, ears, agent. They have a very cookie cutter approach to how they go about marketing yeah, the projects, um, and they have a template with their own branding on it, and they just mm-hmm. plonk your pictures in and yeah. put a little bit of functional copy in there. Absolutely, so there's not a lot of emotion on or branding storytelling. For, storytelling, thank yeah, you. Yeah. It all comes back to it. storytelling. Where great developments have a story that that basically runs through the development like a river. Without the story. It's, as you say, it's a cookie cutter. Um, And I think agents, if you're selling an individual house or um, an individual apartment, then you can basically use that cookie cutter approach from a point of view. But if you're selling a project, it's a whole different story. And I think a lot of people don't understand that there is a big differentiation between selling an individual house and apartment and an actual project. And you touched on branding before. So mm-hmm. how important do you think that is? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's immensely important. I think, um, I guess, Melbourne's design consciousness has shifted um, tremendously over the last 20 years. So um, back in the early 90s, um, campaigns were relatively simplistic, um, often just with a street address, um, some very simple plans. I think the renders that we did back then were all pencil sketches, uh, which was still fantastic, mind you, and they, but they took a long time. And they're very bad if you obviously have a design change. You've got to get the rubbers out. Um, but, yeah, I think the uh, you look at Melbourne as a, as a market, and I think probably Melbourne and New York are the most sophisticated property marketing um, sectors in the world because I guess Melbourne's been blessed with such a huge amount of projects. Um, and I guess from that point of view, we have... You know, become I, th- I think quite good at the craft of selling property, and the branding um, as a consequence of that has become very sophisticated. So, you know, some instances, people you know, spending great budgets on branding their their building or their project, um, and yeah, it, it has changed immensely in the last twenty years. And yeah, I think in terms of people feeling like they're buying into a brand. Um, it certainly does make a big difference, I think, if it's done well uh, in terms of creating that mystique around a project. So what is it the big guys are doing with the marketing of, say, towers that the smaller developer could do themselves, I mean, with budget in mind? Yeah. Um, Well, I think some of the interesting things that you're seeing at the moment are some of the, the digital forms of advertising. So, for example, Facebook target marketing where basically... If someone looks at your project, say under a realestate.com, then basically you can follow them back to their uh, Facebook homepage and advertise on that page. I think your, your spend uh, in terms of inquiry is is excellent for that style of marketing. So there's little ideas, I think, that are a little bit off, out of the norm um, that would be worth looking at. Um, you know, to me, one of the classic 
marketing tools is always looking at the local area where your project is and basically trying to get into, I guess, uh, the headspace and also the market of that local area. So, um, you know, even aspects like flyer drops in the area where, where the project is, looking at sort of solicitors in the area, um, accountants who work in the area who know a lot of people um, in, the, in that sort of location that they can basically tap into these, I guess, sub-streams um, in terms of making sales. Um, so aspects like that, I think, certainly from learning off some of the bigger developers and then applying that sort of almost uh, guerrilla-style marketing towards the smaller projects is certainly a good way to go. Um, you know, it's all a matter of minimising your spend and minimising the time that you're sitting on the market. Um, and I think with the smaller projects, you know, um, you don't need 30 renders of, of your building or, or townhouse development. You can basically create one or two inspirational images, but they need to be inspirational. I think some people fall into the trap of thinking, oh, it's only a small project, I don't want to you know, create anything too great, or I don't want to spend um, too much money on renders, but you know, that's fine. But I think even having a couple of images that are, that are serious knockout images makes a big difference. And certainly helps people understand what's being achieved um, with the project. Um, what about video? Because I know the big guys do some pretty high-end production of video. Yeah. I think you can do some local video marketing that would be fairly Absolutely. low cost. Absolutely. Yeah, well, video is great. Um, I can suggest sort of, you know, doing even micro videos so they don't have to be overly produced. You get your iPhone out and and... Sit the, uh, sit the agent down and, and basically get him to, I guess, talk about some of the key aspects of the project um, and then upload that to the website for the project. Um, you get the developer to talk about the project, the, uh, the architect, and, you know, basically get into the, uh, the mindset of the team and, and extract the, the elements, the key selling elements of the project and basically put them out to market can be done relatively inexpensively. A lot of the bigger projects um, spend um, a great deal of money in terms of animating all the renders. Um, so, you know, for example, you might have um, $120,000 or so basically creating a very impressive fly-through of the project. Um, coming back from that, I guess just developing a good series of still renders and basically um, just animating those or basically shift um, animating them so not actually creating 3D fly-throughs out of them can be a great way to produce a video without ha actually having to do the uh, the animation and such and then you know once again getting back to storytelling having a great script or a great story that basically you know the architect or the developer are talking about the project or the area um, and you know, developing a great script for the video you know, that's once again what people want. They want they want to understand what's so unique about this project, what's so unique about the address, um, why should I buy, create a sense of urgency within the video. But yeah, I guess it doesn't have to have a huge budget sitting behind it if you're clever in terms of the way you produce it. Yeah, and I think finding a, a hook, a local hook, can be helpful. Whether it's something about the local geography or the history, yeah, um, I know for our development we call it Paperbark Place. Yeah, because there were a lot of paperbark trees that grew around the area in one of the local waterways, so Love we it. just sort of linked it to that. And again, you get a bit of a story to the past, and people exactly. can connect with that emotionally. Exactly, and people, especially in Melbourne, people love, I guess, to have some kind of historic reference to a project. So I guess even. Like the people offshore buyers love the historic reference as well. They feel like they're buying into something with substance and, and a history behind it. So, what kind of online or website tactics would you suggest that people do? Uh, well, often um, our process, certainly with the larger projects, is broken down into ROI, which is registration of interest, and then the retail components. Um, so, while we're going through the ROI process, we're basically um, gathering registrations for an upcoming launch of the project. Um, so through this process, we'll basically parallel, ideally, sales offshore um, of the project while we're gathering registrations onshore. Um, so 
you know, sometimes when you basically see a project launch, it may have been um, off market in a sense for two or three months, basically um, establishing sales. So I think uh, from a web, website point of view, when you're going through the ROI process, it certainly um, helps to not put all the information um, in front of the audience at the one time. So I think, you know, great campaigns are, are like a trail of cookies. So each time you get to a cookie, the cookie should get bigger every time you go along. I'm not talking web cookies, I'm talking actual cookies. Um, and the problem is I think when people don't do it right, they'll put a big cookie in front of the audience at the start and the audience will fundamentally get indigestion. So you want to basically tease your buyer um, through this cookie trail and as I say the cookies need to get larger so from a web point of view you put a little bit of an information uh, about the project online but fundamentally what you want out of that is for people to to get excited or interested in the project and then register um, and then once you get closer to the retail launch of a project, the, the web basically becomes more established and you have video feeds, you have news updates, um, et cetera. So, yeah, I think um, that cookie philosophy is certainly very relevant when you're talking about the digital trail of information. So if you give people too much information straight up, often you'll lose the buyer quite quickly. So it's all about the T's. And what sort of trends are you seeing at the moment in terms of project marketing or property marketing? Um, well, yeah, I guess getting back to the videos, video certainly is a big trend in, in marketing property at the moment. Um, and I guess with social media, um, a project can fundamentally almost run like a mini TV station. You can have news updates, you can have um, short videos from particular members of the project team that you can basically put out onto the market. Uh, you can have a sophisticated or a relatively basic video that basically sums up the unique selling points of the project. Um, so video is a big part of what we're seeing at the moment. Certainly um, digital media um, has become immensely valuable and a strong part of a campaign. Um, so. I found with Facebook marketing, you can do short videos, which you can then market to a specific geographic region, so around the site, yeah, and get really good value in terms of cost per view. Correct. You know, four or five cents a view, and you're sort of tapping into your catchment area. Absolutely. There's a lot of um, resources, I think, with some of the companies like realestate.com, uh, whereby you can basically do say, digital blast to a particular um, suburb or a particular demographic. So I think the future of property marketing is nailing who's basically buying this product and basically going and grabbing them as efficiently as you can. So that, to me, is, is where it will basically head, I think, in the future, is that we're not just placing ads in the newspaper um, with a relative sort of scatterbomb approach. We're basically using the laser beam to, to basically focus in on exactly who our market is and basically um, talking directly to that market. And look, that's been the, the, the gold or the, the silver bullet for marketers for a long, long time. Correct. So how do you actually go about further identifying who the buyer is and how you appeal to them? Well, I think, I mean, that's, I guess, fundamentally what makes a great developer is understanding... Uh, the market that, that they're basically delivering a product to. So, yeah, I think it's it's just a matter of, of rolling up the sleeves and getting savvy with an area um, and savvy with a product so that you're basically, number one, from a development point of view, making sure that you're creating a, a product for what this area wants. And number two, um, you're basically marketing to that specific crowd. So I think it's it's, it's, it's a matter of, number one, um, experience, but also developing, I guess, the right team around you so that everything that's created, whether it be from an interior, exterior, architecture point of view, or a sales campaign point of view, is basically um, streamlined towards the right the right market. Yeah. Okay. And if you could only spend money on one channel to market a project, what would it be at the moment? 
Well, that's a tough question. Um, I have done campaigns where 90% of our inquiry has come from signage. Um, so signage is a fantastic uh, medium in terms of once you've set it up, you don't spend any more money on it. Uh, so obviously that is dependent on your address. If you're in a, a back alley, signage is probably not as um, effective. <laughs> um, so certainly digital media, I think, is fantastic um, because I think you, you compare digital media with press media, you spend a lot less per inquiry. That being said, you, you don't get as strong inquiry from press as you do digital. And you can get a little bit sort of, uh, I think, fooled by some of the figures um, with digital media, you know, thinking that it's, it's very strong and if you look at actual sales from various forms, then it's press still is quite strong, but, you know, that comes back to, to money. Um, so it's a tough question, um, but, yeah, certainly signage... Signage is king, I think, from a spend point of view, and I think uh, digital media is is certainly a strong second performer. So if you can only do five tactics or five things to market your project, what would you advise people focus on? Uh, <laughs> that's a tough question. Cause We're all about tough questions it's here. Uh, well, probably yeah, develop a podcast. That's then. correct. That's correct. I'm thinking I'm sweating. Um, yeah, it... I mean, the problem with, with this is that everything is tailored. So everything that we do is tailored towards a particular project and a particular address. So I guess what works for one Project X may not work for Project Y. Um, so that's, I guess, why I, I throw up my red flag. But, uh, yeah, five things. I think um, renders have become immensely... Uh, important. So, you know, fundamentally, we can create a realised form of what we're selling. So, you need to get your renders right. Um, I think that's that's very important. I think you need to get your storytelling right in terms of working out fundamentally what is going to sell this project um, and basically delivering that to the market. You need to make sure that um, you spend money in a way that's that's efficient. So you're not going to waste money basically going in a Vogue or something like this if it's going to have absolutely no impact. I mean, basically there's there's ways of creating a brand awareness. But I think with a relatively mid-sized project, you basically want to, in a sense, make sure that every lead you get um, has, has a fair bit of weight behind it. Um, so I think spending money in the right channels is important. Um, how many, what are we at, three? Mm -hmm. Number four. What about social or what? social accounts, digital properties? So we're looking at the five fundamental things that people should do. So they've got to get their renders right. They've got to get their... Storytelling. Storytelling, correct. Number two, they've got to make sure that what they spend um, is efficient and relatively channeled. Um, I think it's important uh, to have good reporting on a project. So basically, you know, whether the developer does that or the agent um, or the project marketing people take that responsibility but basically to have good accountability in terms of what has been spent and where the leads are coming from so for example we'll often set up separate urls for different mediums that we advertise in so we've got one url we've got one url for signage uh, a different one for press media a different one for online media so basically we can basically track every lead that comes in and then look at every couple of weeks, what's performing and what's not performing. And then, you know, there's the option there of obviously putting more money into what's performing and putting less money into what's not performing or deleting what's not performing. So reporting, I think, is a key aspect of project marketing, um, which I think is sometimes forgotten these days, especially with you know, some of the more established larger companies. People just basically sit down and rely on the agent to be doing their thing, whereas I think if you 
want to make sure that what you're spending is working, um, then reporting is the key to making sure that's, uh, that's happening. And then last of all, um, I think what's, what's also very important um, is to make sure that you sell everything. Because um, although it sounds simplistic, um, I think once you've got over the, uh, the adrenaline rush of releasing a project and selling possibly 60 or 70 percent, um, to me the hardest sales are always at the back end, so the last sort of 10 or 20 percent of the project. Um, and it's been on the market possibly you know, for a short time or for a long time, but that's, that's what makes a great developer, is to be able to sell that, that remaining stock well and efficiently um, and maintain the enthusiasm with the team. Um, and I think, you know, all due respect, a lot of project marketing companies can fall asleep at that stage. So, you know, they basically need to understand, as the agents need to understand, that the last 20% of the project is the developer's profit. If that doesn't sell, um, then there's no future projects. So, you know, that's that's a key to basically maintaining that enthusiasm. And some of the, the better developers that I work with will basically run you know, whether it be bi-weekly or weekly meetings until the project is, is fully realised. So, you know, making sure that every person who's accountable is sitting in that room every week, looking at every lead and basically making sure that the project sells out. And that's, you know, to me, um, I guess one of the f fantastic um, aspects of working with some of the old school Melbourne developers in terms of they will make sure everyone's accountable until the project's finished. So that's a good tip. How do they keep them accountable until the project's finished? Weekly meetings, bi-weekly meetings. Is that twice weekly? Bi-weekly, twice weekly. Or is that every two weeks? I always get confused. Yeah. Bi-weekly meetings okay. twice a week or once every yeah. two weeks. Sounds, sounds professional. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's such a simple thing, but I think just basically having the discipline of sitting in the room with the same team every week or every two weeks and, and looking at it, you know, it's it's it saves people from putting their head in the sand and and uh, thinking that it's, it's going to sell itself. It doesn't. Like it, we've been on projects in some cases for, for quite a long time, and um, you've got to roll up your sleeves, especially if if the market's tough. Um, you need to basically, you know, look at how we're going to sell this. What are we going to do? Can we call the database? Can we have some events in the display, display suite? Uh, can we? Can we put a construction now underway, sign, signage up on the side? It's just you've got to continually, uh, in some cases, uh, re, rebuild the – well, basically you've got to continually, in some cases, refresh the campaign um, to basically maintain the enthusiasm for the market to fully realise the project. So, Now, I wanted to ask you about any – awesome tactical execution that you might have done that stands out or that springs to mind? Um, yeah, I think a couple of, of good strategies um, that we've adopted. Um, I think one particular project, we were having uh, a bit of trouble getting people down to the display, so we basically run a series of micro events at the display over a couple of months, um, which meant that you know, if people basically wanted to meet the architect or the developer or famous chef, they basically had to come down to the display. So it meant that the agents had the opportunity of basically uh, sitting with people and taking them through the project face-to-face uh, -face and also in the display, and obviously the display is where the majority of the tools are. Um, so, yeah, sometimes I think certainly running a series of micro-events uh, can make a big difference in terms of getting traffic down the display. They can also have more of a financial theme as well, so you can basically come down and learn how, learn how to invest and, and learn how to basically, I guess, in some cases, demystify the process of, of buying off the plan. Yeah, so we had a project a couple of years ago that was uh, that was a little bit slow, uh, and the developer tapped me on the shoulder and said, listen, what do, what do we need to do to create more sales? Um, this particular project had a, a quite a big database, so um, we actually um, telemarketed the whole database um, and ran a series of micro events at the display, um, which I guess basically re invigorated the database and basically, um, yeah, all of a sudden the, 
projects start to go on a run and start selling. And you know, sometimes it doesn't take a lot to to reactivate a campaign, but it's a matter of uh, I think coming up with the right idea, um, and ideally a relatively economical one. But uh, yeah, certainly sometimes the database can be a sleeping tiger. So you know, if you consider them as past registration, but in actual fact, um, it can still be quite live. So sometimes it, it's, uh, well, in that case, it was certainly beneficial to basically call you know, over 2,000 people and basically get them down to the display. And uh, So that made a big difference for that project. With Park in St Kilda Road, which we marketed a couple of years ago, um, we also introduced Shannon Bennett uh, as a celebrity chef. So he was basically brought in as a, a project ambassador um, so he was involved in the actual conceptualization of the kitchens, um, but also was was part of the uh, collaborators, part of the project team. Um, so at openings, he was there and basically, um, yeah. So basically, Shannon was a, a big part of I think the mystique or the prestige of buying at Park. Yeah. Um, so people, you know, I guess with Melbourne, you know, I guess at the moment a big part of. Uh, project or a big part of apartment living is the kitchen so the kitchen in a sense has become the heart of the home and uh you know, certainly you look at the cooking shows on at the moment etc and um the chef has become king you know the restaurants of old they used to be out the back now they're at the front yeah i think certainly having shannon bennett as part of the park project certainly gave people um an aspiration in terms of what they were buying into and even from a PR perspective, I think um, the amount of stories that we were able to basically um, generate from having having Shannon as a kitchen ambassador had a huge impact on the project. Yeah, and you can create content around those events as well. Correct. Videos, Correct. written text content, website, blog pages, things like that. Absolutely. And sort of, yeah, once again, to get back to project stories, I mean, stories um, have been told throughout history and, um, you know, it's basically the art of storytelling. You, you look at a good project, people will basically tell their friends that, you know, I've, bought, I've just bought a kitchen designed by Shannon Bennett or um, all the projects, um, appliances are all melee, et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of, I think, the exponential effect of creating or generating great development stories um, can never be taken too lightly. And what kind of budget... Would you suggest people allow for marketing? Well, as a rule of thumb, and um, I don't know whether it applies on every project, but as a rule of thumb, you'd say 1% of gross realisation, um, and then basically that would be cut 50% into project tools and then 50% into um, media spend. And when I say media spend, that's basically... Um, press media, online media, etc., and then agents' tools is brochure, website, etc., etc. So, uh, but with the larger projects, um, you couldn't apply that same rule. So it it certainly depends on the size of the projects. But certainly, as a as a as a generalisation, you could apply one percent from a pure feasibility point of view. Okay. And what mistakes do you often see developers making when they're marketing their projects? Um, I think one of the big mistakes I see is just poor representation of, of basically what they're, what they're creating. So you know, just in some cases uh, not really understanding what's going to sell the project. Um, that's a fundamental mistake. Um, and then not presenting their project very well. So poor renders, um, poor storytelling, no display, um, assuming that a project's going to sell out quite quickly, um, not having a good feel for the market. Uh, so they're the fundamental big ones. I usually like to ask our guests for one tip that they've got for developers out there. What would yours be, Ben? I think my tip would be to basically use the right people to do the right job. I think often I see uh, you know, developers get some aspects of presenting their project right and then they'll you know, use a cousin who has a camera to shoot the photography or 
get it printed offshore or get the model made offshore and it comes back and it looks like it's been in a, in a cyclone. So I think, you know, basically creating or establishing the right team for a project is critical and then basically allowing that team to, to do what they do best. Well, Ben Buxton, we might leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks for being on the Property Developer Podcast. Quite a pleasure. Speak to you next time. Hope I look okay. You've certainly got a face for podcasting. (laughs) Well, there you go. I trust you enjoyed that conversation with Ben Buxton about project marketing. I do think that great marketing is often the difference between similar property developments selling out faster and for higher prices than their competitors. And you would be wise to continuously improve how you market your projects, whether that be through using a design agency or pushing your agent for better quality materials. In terms of what I took out of the conversation, I thought Ben's five things great developers get right was a terrific summary of what you can focus on to take your developing to the next level. Ben covered these five areas. One, get your renders right. I tell you, I've seen some shocking renders for off-the-plan sales around the area where I am developing. I know it can seem expensive to get renders done, though I believe it doesn't have to cost thousands. You can go to places like Upwork.com and find freelancers who can do good artist impressions. But in comparison to the value of what you are trying to sell, it is a worthwhile investment if you get great quality emotive images. As Ben said, you might only need one or two aspirational images to get the buyer's emotions running. But you do need something visual for them to lock onto and get an emotional, aspirational connection happening. 2. Develop a story to support your project. Again, this is a powerful tool when done well. We all love buying into a story, whether it is the mystique of the engineering in a Mercedes-Benz or the style of Apple products. People love stories and they want to be able to share them with others. So see if you can make a connection with the history or context of your location and work that into your marketing copy and imagery. Three, spend money efficiently. This goes without saying, but be careful to not run off and start pumping money into the latest bright shiny object, whether that is a new social media channel or a piece of printed collateral that the agent really likes. Make sure it is going to serve your project and provide a return, which leads into the next one. Four, put in place measures to ensure good reporting. Make sure you're meeting with your agent or team regularly, whether it is once a week or every two weeks, and keep them accountable for the number of leads, where they are coming from, how are they being followed up. Review what is working and what isn't. Then if need be, adapt your marketing mix. And last but certainly not least, make sure you sell everything. Keep pushing for those sales right up until you cross the finish line. Be wary of your team suffering from fatigue and then getting excited about the next project that is coming along. Make sure you stay focused and enthused about the project and sell that bad boy out. As Ben said, the last 10 to 20% can be the hardest, but that is also where all your profit is. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I'd love an iTunes review. If you want more, then head over to propertydeveloperpodcast.com and leave a comment under the episodes page. Until next time, may all your projects sell out quickly. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas, and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com. 